Welcome to Murder Mile. Today, I'm standing on Rupal Street in Waterloo, a few streets south of the happy slapping attack on David Morley, the dumped body of Peggy Roberts, the frozen remains of baby Harry Hartley, and one street west of the woman who never spoke her killer's name. Coming soon to Murder Mile. Created by social visionary George Peabody in the late 1800s, the Peabody buildings were, and still are, a series of inner city estates to provide clean and affordable housing for the most disadvantaged. To qualify, every tenant must be neat, decent, law-abiding, and obey the rules on noise and cleanliness. As beyond these precision pieces of brownstone history, you won't find a dumped fridge, a stinky bin bag, a slump drunk, a corridor blocked by ten pairs of pants, wiggling on a line like a budget magic mic show, or a courtyard crammed full of car parts, like a hoarder got bored building a museum to a Nissan Micra scrapyard. Simple rules we could all live by. Back in 1950, Flat 21, on the fourth floor of Block F, was home to 42-year-old bachelor William Donahue. Described as quiet and pleasant, he was typical of the residents. By day he worked hard as a bus conductor, and by night, if he wasn't on an early shift, he would go to his local pub for a pint. William was an ordinary man, with no real problems, who was never angry, violent, or disturbed. But all that would change on the night of Thursday the 7th of December 1950, when in an unprovoked and frenzied attack, he would brutally stab a friend of a friend to death. This was an incident so bizarre even William would struggle to believe that he had murdered Thomas Meany. But he had. My name is Michael. I am your tour guide. And this is Murder Mile. Episode 173. A buddy, a dummy, a dead man. To say that William Donahue was an ordinary man would be an understatement. Born on the 7th of April 1908, William, known as Bill, was raised in an Irish Catholic family as the second youngest of three brothers and three sisters to George and Nellie Donahue. Being working class with a basic education, they earned an honest living, kept out of trouble, and their lives were uneventful. As a person, he stood out only as much as the next man, being of average height and build. He had neat dark hair, a fresh face, and prominent eyebrows, but not to the point where people would stare. Having left school age 14, William began a series of low-paid but well-respected jobs at which he stayed for two to three years, left of his own accord, and his work record ranged between satisfactory to exemplary. Beginning in 1922 as a page boy and lift attendant at the Strand Palace Hotel, from 1925 to 1930 as a barman in Southwark, Dagenham and Covent Garden, he spent seven years as a porter at Waterloo Station, three years lugging frozen meats at a storage firm, and when war was declared, he enlisted to fight as a private in the army, serving in France, Egypt and the Middle East. He was awarded several campaign medals having fought. He suffered no obvious trauma, he spoke openly of his service but never bragged, and he retained his bayonet as a souvenir. 
discharged on the 27th of September 1945. Always keen to earn an honest crust. Within three weeks, he had begun a new career as a conductor on the number 10 bus from Brixton to Waterloo. Being diligent, he was polite, cheerful and punctual. He earned six pounds and ten shillings a week, which wasn't much, but it was enough to pay his bills and to keep him comfortable. And his uniform was always neat and freshly ironed. Like most people, his life was pockmarked with little tragedies. His mum died when he was 17. His dad and older brother died when he was 26. And his sister Nellie had suffered a breakdown in 1935 and had remained as an inpatient at Cane Hill Mental Hospital for the last 15 years. But like everything else, he dealt with it. In the summer of 1948, having fulfilled the tenancy criteria, William moved into 21F of the Peabody buildings. Comprising of a room measuring just 14 feet by 12, it wasn't much, but it was enough for him. With space for a single bed, a solitary armchair, a small table and a chest of drawers. It was practical and lacked a homely touch. But as he lived alone and rarely had guests, it suited his needs. He had a wireless for nightly entertainment a small hob for cooking basic meals. And as an ex-army bachelor, instead of buying a bread knife, he cut thick doorstep slices of white bread with his 10-inch bayonet. And that's pretty much it. William Donoghue was as unremarkable as anyone. Across his 42 years of life, he had never married or had kids and had no plans to do so. He lived a solitary life with a small group of friends but could happily chat to anyone in the pub without being a bother. So why he would stab his guest to death is anyone's guess. But he did. Only he wouldn't know it. just as William was as ordinary as anyone else. Thursday the 7th of December 1950 was a day which began like any other. Being midweek, he still had a few days to work till the weekend. But having received his Christmas bonus, he was looking forward to spending the festive holiday with his loved ones. In court, William would state... I finished work about 1.22 p.m. As he was due on an early shift the next day, he would usually head home, pop on the radio, and be in bed by nine. But with a stack of notes burning a hole in his pocket, he felt like he deserved a bit of a blowout. Before going to my sister's in Brixton, I had two Guinnesses in the Black Horse and two in the windmill. His consumption was not excessive for him. The pubs were familiar and he sat reading the paper, chatting to the locals. I stopped at my sister's from a little after three to twenty past four. He collected a suit. He seemed his usual self and he didn't complain of any issues or incidents. I got home about twenty past five. A sighting confirmed by Marguerite Veach, his next door neighbour at 22F, who confirmed that he stayed for about ten minutes. He courteously greeted her. Hi, Margaret. And left just after half past five, still wearing his dark grey uniform and overcoat as a bus conductor for London Transport. I went to a pub called the Dark Horse on Blackfriars Road. We're being irregular. 
I played a few games of darts with the governor and two customers, and had several Guinnesses to drink. Which was the only thing different about that night. I don't usually drink Guinness, only mild or bitter. At 6pm, William entered the Prince Albert further up Blackfriars Road. As a regular, he had a few Guinnesses and played darts with the landlord and several employees of the Amalgamated Press, who didn't know him, but said that he was very friendly. So far, William was yet to meet Thomas Meany, the man he would murder. And stranger still, as a friend of a friend, William barely knew him. Born in 1890, 60-year-old Thomas Meany, known as Tom, was a quiet, good-natured man of medium build and height, who liked darts, beer and sport. Being a generation older than William, he was unable to see active service in the First World War, owing to a deformed right forearm and false elbow joint. But he did his duty as a messenger, and he had been a police driver for the last 30 years. Unlike William, Thomas was married. Having been a loyal husband to Margaret for 39 years, raising a family of eight children, two of whom who still lived at home, and they lived in nearby Stamford Street. As a creature of habit, Thomas kept to a routine as regular as it was predictable. Working out of Lambeth Police Garage five days a week, he would finish by 6 p.m., be home by 7.15 p.m., and that day would be no different. He had a wash, ate some tea, did his pools coupons, and at 9.25 p.m., he headed out to the pub. At 9.30 p.m., regular as clockwork, Thomas Meany met 72-year-old Richard Copley, known as Dick, in the Brunswick Arms at 25 Stamford Street. His local pub, situated just 300 yards from his home, as pals for 40 years, the two had always sat quietly in the public saloon, playing cards, chatting, and drinking no more than three pints of mild. Neither man was a big drinker, and Thomas disliked spirits. According to his friends, Thomas was pleasant, easygoing, an affable chap who was no trouble and not given to playing practical jokes. This may seem an odd thing to say, but it will make sense. Back at the Prince Albert pub on Blackfriars Road, having sunk six bottles of Guinness, which was about average, William purchased a bottle of Booth's gin and a bottle of orange squash as off sales, as he was planning to visit his other sister the next day and place the bottles in his overcoat pockets. When he left at 9.45pm, the landlord said he looked relatively sober as he said good night. Good night. William could have gone home to bed as he had worked the next morning, but being 45 minutes until closing time, he decided to go to the Brunswick Arms. A nice pub he had been to before, but he was not a regular. At 10.15pm, two hours before the murder, William entered the pub. Seeing Richard, who he knew as they lived on adjacent streets, Richard introduced William to Thomas. I've seen you a few times drinking at the Stamford. Yeah, that's right. Good pub, that. Yeah, good pub. 
Decent point, too. But they had never met until that day. As the three sat chatting, in a tone described as friendly and calm, William bought them both a half pint, as they were over their usual three pint limit, and they sat drinking until last orders. With the bar shut, even though the gin was for his sister, William opened the bottle. He poured himself a shot, but having missed Richard's glass as he moved it, and Thomas's having covered his glass with his hand. Being reprimanded by the manager, Hey, what do you think you're doing? Do you want me to get into trouble? William apologised. He recorked the bottle, and the three men left. William was good-natured about his little indiscretion, and witnesses said that he was tipsy, but not drunk. Ten minutes later, they entered Duchy Street, a third of a mile southwest of the Brunswick Arms. As this was the road where Richard lived, he bid them a good night and left. Good night, lads. Thomas was due home, and with both men working the next day, they should have called it a night. Only with William stating, I said to this chap, Come on up, have a drink. I'll open this bottle of gin. Thomas decided to do so. At 10.45pm, Thomas Meany and William Donahue entered flat 21F of the Peabody buildings. They sat, drank and laughed. We had a nice chat, opened up the bottle and we drank a lot. After we had emptied the bottle, he lay on my bed with his overcoat on. I sat on the chair, leaning on the table, and more or less nodded off. And that was that, as the two men drifted off to sleep. Within the hour, William would stab Thomas to death in a blind frenzy. And yet his motive would be so bizarre, it would defy belief even to him. The morning of Friday the 8th of December 1950 was cold and bitter, with a bright glaring sun. It had been a long night for Margaret Meany, as she lay in a half-empty bed, wondering why her husband hadn't come home. Unable to concentrate on anything else, she cut short her graveyard shift as a cleaner and followed Thomas's usual route from his house to the Brunswick Arms. But it would all be in vain, as across the morning, word bled through the streets of Waterloo that a man's body had been found. At 7.20 a.m., the splitting wail of his alarm clock pierced his thick head as William awoke in a fog. He never normally drank on the night before an early shift and having sunk ten bottles of Guinness and drained a bottle of gin, with his head pounding, now he was regretting the whole night. Before I got into bed, I put an alarm clock on the stool by the side of the bed. It was set for half past four. It had been like that all week. I don't know whether it went off, but when I woke up, the alarm said twenty past seven. And seeing he had overslept, his first thought was, Oh shit, I'm late for work. Standing up, as best as his wobbly legs would allow, he spotted his crumpled uniform at the foot of his solitary armchair 
in this small empty room. With the curtains closed, this little space suitable for a bachelor was bathed in black. But as he switched on the light, it was then that he saw the blood. It was everywhere, across the floor, up the walls and on the bed. With a thick sticky pool of crimson at his feet, dark arcs of red spattered up his chest of drawers, and a long heavy trail, as if something had been dragged from the floor to the door. William saw blood on his hands, only he wasn't hurt. It can't have been, he thought. No, I saw it myself. It can't be real. But it was. On the table lay the detritus of last night's fun. Two glasses, a newspaper, an empty bottle of gin. And lying dead centre, as always, was his ten-inch bayonet. Still sharp from his military service, the blade, which was usually dotted with tiny crumbs of white bread, was instead thick with blood up to the hilt. With booze still coursing through his veins, it could have been a trick of the light, an echo of a dream, or a sick prank by a pal with a warped sense of fun. Only he knew that it wasn't. As following the red smudge trail to the door, two foot wide by twenty feet long. As he reached the communal landing on the fourth floor of Block F, there he found the truth and the horror. At seven thirty a.m., having exited her flat. 74-year-old widow Emma Duthry saw William. His pale face etched in shock as he stared at the motionless body of a man he knew he had murdered. With his trembling voice, he asked, Mrs. Duthry, would he call the police? And he then went back inside to await his arrest. Just as dawn was breaking, through the dim winter light, PCs Woodcock and Ross arrived to secure the scene. Seeing William seated and nervously smoking a cigarette, which shook in his hand like a persistent blur, he confessed, "If that is a real man, then I done it. I thought he was joking with me. I must have struck him with my bayonet and dragged him onto the landing." William Donahue was arrested on the charge of murder, and he was calmly escorted to Southwark Police Station. The investigation was headed up by Chief Inspector Leslie Knight of CID. It was a case as clear-cut as any he had investigated before. As the only suspect, William Donahue was seen with Thomas Meany in the Brunswick Arms by the landlord. On Duchy Street, by Richard Copley, who heard William invite Thomas back to his room for a drink, and by several neighbours who heard them return to the Peabody Buildings in Flat Twenty One F. Both William and Thomas's fingerprints were found on bottles and glasses. Their alcohol levels were as heavy as two men who had drained a large bottle of gin. William's bayonet and hands were stained with Thomas's blood group. And even clearer, William had confessed to the man's murder. Lying face down along the concrete corridor connecting the fourth floor flats, with his legs straight and his arms above his head, it was clear that William had dragged Thomas by his hands. With a bloody pool having formed under his face and his clothing soaked. The body had been dumped while he was still alive, but not conscious, as he had not moved a muscle. 
and comparing his body temperature to the night itself. Being dead roughly seven hours, that put his time of death at midnight. When questioned, Margaret Veach in the flat to the right, Emma Duffy to the left, and John Howard one floor below, said they heard three distinct thuds at 11.55 p.m. As confirmed by Marguerite, who had looked at her clock. But no one could tell where the thuds had come from, and they had heard nothing else. For the detective, William had definitely murdered Thomas. But the question wasn't how, but why. These were two semi-strangers with no previous grudge, who had joined each other by invite in the home of the culprit. They hadn't argued, and no screams were heard, only laughter. When his body was examined, Thomas's wallet, watch and wedding ring were all in place. There was no evidence of poisoning or assault, and both men were medically examined, ruling out any hint of homosexuality. At 4.30pm, Dr. Keith Simpson examined the body of Thomas Meany at Southwark Mortuary. With a level of 300 milligrams of alcohol per 100 milliliters of blood, Thomas was heavily intoxicated, which was why there were no defensive wounds to his hands, arms or fingers. Suffering a blunt trauma to his face, nose and chin, the unconscious man had either fallen or had been pulled out of bed and had hit the floor hard, too drunk to wake. Based on his injuries, Thomas was lying on his side, facing right when he was attacked. And with his wounds consistent with a bayonet, William had stabbed Thomas in the head and neck 17 times. In an assault described as frenzied. With 11 wounds penetrating one and a half inches deep and grouped about his neck, Six others had sunk four and a half inches into his neck, splitting his jugular vein, cartoid artery, and resulting in blood loss and shock. The evidence against William was irrefutable. And yet one question remained unanswered. Why did he murder Thomas Meany? At 2.15pm in Southwark Police Station, William would state, I woke up cold and I wanted to get into my bed as I was on early duty. I shook the chap in my bed and said, come on, get up. When he did not move, I thought he was playing a practical joke on me. He fell on the floor. He didn't move. And then I thought, it was a dummy or a mannequin. He fell like a sack of coal. I got hold of it again, thinking the man was hiding somewhere in the room or the corridor. And I said, this is what I'll do to your dummy. I picked up the bayonet off my table and I stabbed down. I dragged it across the floor, through the door to the landing. And as I let it go, I said, that's why I think of your dummy. I went back into my room, set my alarm clock, and went to bed. Examined at Wandsworth Prison, William appeared exhausted and shocked, but was cooperative and was declared fit to stand trial. For the police, as strange as his motive seemed, William was not a crazed maniac who had snapped. As to everyone, he was a quiet, inoffensive, and respectable man. Believing his story that he truly thought that the man was a dummy, fueled by excessive drinking, which may have resulted in a loss of judgment and potentially hallucinations, he was charged with murder. 
but on the 9th of January 1951 at the Old Bailey, he pleaded guilty to the lesser charge of manslaughter. William Donahue served three years in prison for the death of Thomas Meany. Upon his release from prison, he lost his job as a bus conductor and having breached his rules, he lost his flat at the Peabody buildings. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is that. Oh. Hope you enjoyed that. That was a nice weird one there. Oh. As I say, do you know, not not everything wraps up neatly, do you know, even though things go to court, not everything is kind of neat in a bundle. I know people will be going, but why did you do it? Why did you do it? You have to let us know. Sometimes, sometimes investigators don't know. Sometimes uh, even the, the culprits themselves don't know what's going on. So, yeah, weird one today. Uh, let me just go and pop on a cup of tea and then we'll, 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 oh, dear, a bit hungover today. Bit hungover. Went out yesterday. Had some cheeky jars, just like just like Thomas and William. Only no one ended up dead, I think. So I'm gonna have another coffee because I think my head needs it. Early morning. You can hear the birds tweeting outside. Uh, ooh, got a little bit of apple pie to eat. I'll, I'll try to reintroduce sugars and things into my diet, but not. Not excessively, not in the old way. Uh, had a Belgian bun during the week. It's all right, it's all right, it's fine. The problem is I haven't had fats in a while so I could kind of taste the fats. Oh, what else is going on? This is a weird situation. So I've got two laptops in front of me now. So, main laptop, laptop A. I was ed doing editing in Costa the other week and I realized it wasn't charged and I thought, well, that's weird. So luckily my IT people are just around the corner and I took it in and they sniffed it and they went, yeah, it's uh, your, power, your power adapter's blown. And I was like, oh shit. They were like, that's fine, it's easy to fix. And then they were like, oh no. Um, Asus, wonderful people, lo lovely laptops. But for some reason they were, they were like, there's only, right, we need this specific charger for you and it's not available in the UK. It's not available in America. We're gonna to have to ship, get get it from China. We're gonna to have to get it from China. So uh, that's gonna be weeks, and that's my main laptop, which is a real pain. So I've got old faithful laptop, which is here. So that's recording the audio at the moment, although the battery on it is only three hours, which is a real pain. So I'm gonna to have to go to Costa Coffee in a bit. But I do have a, 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 an extra backup. So I, I, I found a Chromebook and I was like, oh, Chromebook, 200 quid. And it's the right size. It's a big screen. I thought, let's do that. Let's have that as a backup, uh, even if I don't use it. And I thought, let's set it up. It's great. I'm doing what so I've written three episodes because I've got time to do that, which is great. It doesn't let me do the soft, the editing software, bloody Chromebook, because there's no, there's a tiny internal memory. And I, each podcast episode is about two gigs of data it's like two or three gigs because there's a lot of information i condense it down to like 80 megabytes but yeah the new this new new laptop can do i can do writing on it but i can't do editing which is a real pain so i've had to buy a new laptop so we've got a laptop four won't arrive until next week fffs so oh it's all go it's all go coffee's almost ready which is a good thing oh Right, coming back, coming back, coming back. Hope I don't spill coffee over two laptops. So yeah, uh, Old Faithful Laptop is currently recording this audio. Uh, the Chromebook is, uh, I got the script on it, because that's where I wrote the script. Uh, new laptop is being ordered, but it won't arrive till Monday, and then I've got to set it up. Oh my God, I'm gonna be Jimmy Four laptops. Oh, mother of pearl, yeah. And, and Chromebooks are no good for someone like me, because you need, because it's all cloud-based, and you need to have, good internet whereas where i'm now i can't even get texts 
I mean, in between hills. It's like, I know everyone will go, just move your boat. Just, just move your boat somewhere better. It's like, it's, you don't really have that choice quite often. It's, yeah, I need to be near a water point at the moment. That's priority one. Need to be near bins. You know, some, and sometimes all the good places where are good internet, you can't you can't moor up, so it's not as easy easy as that. Uh, what else is going on? It's it's duckling season, which is nice. There's uh, two little families of ducklings outside. There's one. I had a panic the other day because there was a mummy duck with twelve ducklings, and then the next day there was only three ducklings. I was like, oh no! But then I realised there was two different mummy ducklings. One's got twelve. One's got three. And they both still have their complement of, of little ducklies. So that's really good. Really good. What else is going on? Um, um, I'm on TikTok. Oh, no, I know. Oh, I'm I, a bit late to the party. But um, I've started doing uh, the talks. I do my talks. Uh, they're, not as, they're not professional like the kind of the YouTube videos that I do that take hours and nobody watches. <laughs> the talks are just, just shit. Like, most things on TikTok is shit. But getting a lot of listeners getting a lot of new people on there so I'm, I'm i'm doing my talks now so uh really good so places you may have heard of in murder mile uh i'm kind of uh filming those i'm adding in new stuff all the time i'd i've been doing it for about six months and getting nowhere like no no one looking at it at all and then i i uploaded a, some footage of a of an extractor fan that had caught fire it wasn't even caught fire it was smoking a bit that's got 60,000 views already. So I thought, wow, okay. So I did another one where I pointed out uh, the colour of lights in an alley. That's good. That's had 120,000 views already. Uh, a little joke about an alley, another one. Another one about a case, that the uh, Camille Gordon case. I wrapped that up in about 10 minutes. Uh, 10 minutes, that would be terrible on TikTok. I did, it, I did it in like less than a minute. Put it online. That's about to hit half a million views. I have no idea what's going on. I've uploaded some stuff last night. I'm uploading stuff all the time. So uh, I do a bulk of them at the weekend and then push them through. So, um, yeah, join me on TikTok. Just search Murder Mile. I'm on there. Um, if you're a TikToker, that might be something you might enjoy. So, yeah, give it a go. I'll, I'll, I'll put a link in the show notes. That would be helpful, wouldn't it? So I've got hiccups now. Um, big thank you to our new Patreon supporters. Who are Jenny Hall, Amy Beasley, Mrs. B, Carla Randall, and Brittany Henderson. Thank you all. Thank you for becoming patron supporters. Um, if you are a patron supporter, I got this done before my laptop went kasplooey, and I uploaded the video for this and the crime scene photos. And if you think this episode is weird, it's really worth having a look at the crime scene photos for this one. Odd. Very odd, but very. When you see everything, you just go because you think you think. Oh, his his motive is kind of all over the shop, and it, what, everything he's saying is bullshit. But you can't you can't fake that kind of evidence. And when you look at the crime scene, it's just it's like c considering they were absolutely pissed off their fa faces, and even when um, he was being interviewed, the the the, uh, the police doctor was there, and he said. They had to double check with him and say, are you OK to do this interview? You don't have to because you're still under the influence of alcohol. And he was like, I, I just want to do my bit now. And then when I sober up some more, I'll do another interview. That's not a problem. But yeah, they were all saying he, he even when the uh, original police officers turned up, they said he looked rough. He looked really like worse for wear. So that he, they had been massively drinking. So you can't, you can try and fabricate a scene and you'll cock it up, but you can't fabricate it when you're pissed. Anyway, let's do some quiz questions and then we'll dive into some extra stuff. I'm still recording on, on laptop too. That's good. Right. Good old laptop, old faithful laptop, which recorded all the... Uh, oh, no. No. that They recorded the, the first 100, but not the first 20, I think. That was my old Toshiba, which died died the death right let's do some quiz questions don't forget as always i might ball some of these up or i might edit them out of the episode so uh, you never know uh, unless you listen to walk with me then you'll find out um question number one which benefactor created the peabody buildings clues in the question <laughs> question number two what number bus was william the conductor on question number three where did the bus go from and to? Question number four. William was playing darts with the employees of what company? 
I think I used to work with these people. Not those people specifically. Question number five. What job did William do and where? Sorry, uh, rephrase that. What job did Thomas do and where? So what job did Thomas do and where? The guy who was murdered. Question number six. What brand was the gin they consumed? Question seven. William purchased a bottle of gin and a bottle of what? Question eight. On what street did this... <coughs> Question eight. On what street did they say goodbye to Richard Copley? Question nine. What time was uh, William's alarm clock... What time was William's alarm clock set to go off? And question 10, who oversaw the investigation? I'm getting confused. I keep going to reach for my mouse to scroll down the page and the mouse is controlling the uh, the recording. Ugh. Right, uh, let's do some stuff. Um, Thomas Meany, uh, seems like a nice guy, 60 years old, married, lived at 79 Stamford Street, so not too far down from the pub. Uh, wife, two children still living at home, but obviously a, a family of eight. Um, um, that's the kind of the key thing that was in there. Everyone said a good natured guy, quiet, but not given to practical jokes. And that was kind of key in the investigation that everyone said he's a nice guy, but he's not the kind of joker. So this is this is weird. Why Thomas did he did he see a dummy? Why would he believe that it was a dummy? Was this just an excuse or was he hallucinating? It's it's an odd one, isn't it? It's a really odd one. And uh, if it was a dummy, it was a bloody realistic one. So, um, uh, so yeah, Thomas, uh, no real ailment, ailments except, obviously, a deformed right forearm with a false elbow joint. He suffered from mild bronchitis and emphysemia, but apart from that, was in relatively good health. William Donoghue, we've kind of gone through his history already. Um, no history of... Um, mental inability no kind of uh trauma that he'd suffered prior um he it seemed to it seemed to cope obviously you know people serving in world war Two. he'd served in uh three different countries overseas um he never really spoke of his trauma but you know you you don't know there's uh, a lot of people who kind of come come through uh war situations don't talk about i mean people try to now which is a good thing but obviously a lot of the people through world war Two. um never really spoke of, of what they'd endured so uh there's a who knows maybe he saw some horrible things when he was out there maybe something to do with the dummy it's not in his record uh the police didn't find anything but not everything is written down uh when he was out that night he was still wearing his london transport bus conductor uniform uh but not his peaked cap which uh he he would always take that off when he'd come home but he would happily go out that night wearing his conductor's uniform oh, i couldn't do that i'd still feel like i'm at work um, as mentioned, the only kind of hint uh, of mental uh, illness in his family was his sister Nellie, who was an inpatient at Cane Hill Hospital for 15 years. Um, she s s seemed to have suffered uh, a mental breakdown. She'd moved to South Africa originally with her husband. The relationship had broken down and, <clears throat> and she'd come back and had a breakdown. Uh, so there doesn't seem to be much in the family of that. Um, he was drinking a lot that night, but he wasn't prone to... Uh, drunken habits although you know he would this says me i i had like six or seven pints last night some people might say that's a bit excessive i'm just like it's once a week who cares and i was out with a pal having a good time uh which is probably why i sound croaky ah it's all good um he'd, he'd lived in the flat for about two and a half years he'd always been alone he'd never married didn't have any children um his room was quite simple it was practical um he this is why he goes out to the pub a lot because he's kind of he's always looking to be entertained like he he when he has lunch and dinner he uh eats lunch and dinner at the bus garage canteen so that's kind of his way of being out with people when you look at him it's kind of his home is a place of where he comes back to but it's you know there, there's uh, it's quite a solitary place so you, you can see why he wants to be out and you can also see why he would invite people back uh there was a suggestion of homosexuality there obviously this is the 1950s the two men in a room by themselves uh in his flat they're both drunk one is sprawled out on the bed uh the police checked everything they did a, f a full examination of both the body and 
uh, William. Uh, they examine their penises, examine their anuses, which obviously they have to do. Uh, no evidence of any kind of sex at, at all. No semen, nothing. So uh, that was entirely ruled out. But they they have to check that just in case. Uh, William's statement, let's do that. Uh uh, he said, I finished uh, early duty on Thursday, the 7th of December, 1950 at 1.22 p.m. I went to see my sister on Bartley Street in Brixton and collected a new suit from her. Uh, before arriving at my sister's, I had four or five Guinnesses. Uh, we all know someone who will be enjoying this episode. Um, two in the Black Horse and two or three in the Windmill. Good pubs. Uh, I stopped at my sister's uh, from a little after three until 20 past four and got home to my flat at uh, 20 past five. I left my flat again about 20 to six. I went to a pub called the Black Horse in Blackfriars where I had a game of darts with the governor and two or three customers and had several Guinnesses to drink. I don't usually drink Guinness, only mild or bitter. So why he'd moved on to the Guinnesses that day, we don't know. But, you know, it's Christmas bonus time. Maybe, maybe sometimes, sometimes we all have, I go through phases of going, hmm, might have, might have uh, Guinness instead. Uh, but not around St. Patrick's Day. I hate that one. St. Patrick's Day when people go, oh, I've got to have a Guinness because uh, St. Patrick, which is bullshit because he did, he was a teetotaler anyway. And they, they do that face. They go, oh, look at me drinking the black stuff. You know, they all start saying that and then they swig it and then they realise, they go, oh, I don't like the flavour. And then it's just like, why drink it? Why drink it? Just because someone says you have to drink it. I deliberately don't drink Guinness on St. Patrick's Day. Just a spite. Uh, he said, uh, I left there about 10 o'clock and walked to the Brunswick Arms in Stamford Street. Inside I saw a man uh, I have had a drink with once before and whom uh, I knew uh, was a police van driver, Thomas. Uh, I had two or three Guinnesses with this man and left the pub at half past ten. Um, so they, they weren't buddies, but don't forget, he's the kind of guy who will happily just turn up in a pub and start chatting to anyone. And everyone says, you know, he's nice, he's pleasant, he's no bother at all. Uh, I bought a bottle of gin and a bottle of her her, but I did not see the her her in my flat this morning. I am not certain uh, if I brought this in the Brunswick Arms or the first pub. It, it was the first pub. Uh, I left the pub with the man and we walked together towards my flat i said to this chap come up to my flat and have a drink i'll open this bottle of gin i did not intend to open open it as i'd brought it as a present it was for his sister um the chap and i went up to my flat together we had a nice little chat and opened up the bottle and we drank the lot so they'd arrived about quarter to 11 and the murder happened they reckon just before midnight so they'd sunk a bottle of if this is true they'd sunk a bottle of gin a whole bottle of gin it's a relatively big bottle of gin within an hour or maybe they were swiggling swigging on the on the way back we don't know uh, he said after we had emptied the bottle he lay on my bed with his overcoat on um this is a small room so in the room is the armchair and the bed and the kitchen table so it's, it's a one roomed just a one roomed flat that's all it is so uh that makes sense uh where was he uh he yep uh, i sat on the stool leaning on the table and more or less dozed off uh which makes sense because they've had a shit ton to drink i woke up cold and wanted to get into bed as i was on early duty i went and i shook the chap on the bed and said come on get out of it or something like that when he did not move i thought he was playing a practical joke on me so i got hiccups and as i understood he was a practical joker uh that's not true uh, he had never played any practical jokes on me before and he had never been to my flat before that was true i pulled him again not that way i pulled him again and said come on he fell on the floor and i thought he was a dummy he fell like a sack of coal so he didn't put his arms out and the injuries are correct in that that they said he had a kind of a, a blunt flat trauma injury to his eyebrows and his nose and his chin but he didn't move so he was entire he was out cold um i i got hold of the body again thinking it was a dummy and said uh this is what i'll do to your dummy i picked up the bayonet off the table i used it as a bread knife and i stabbed down just before i stabbed down i pinched what i th uh, i punched what i thought to be the dummy two or three times but there was no movement 
After I stabbed down, I saw red and thought it was a theatrical thing he was using, where you pinch a tube and blood spurts out. Uh, I, see, we don't know why he knows about that. Maybe that was on TV or something. Uh, we don't know why he seems to know about theatrical dummies and because uh, they use that in theatres and things. So, uh, yeah, uh, I dragged what I thought was a dummy across the floor, through the door to the landing by his coat. And as I let go of him on the landing, I said, that's what I think of your dummy. I still thought he was hiding or had left the building, leaving the dummy behind, which is odd because he didn't see him carry a dummy into the flat. Uh, I went back to my room and went to bed. Before I got into bed, I put the alarm clock on the stool by the side of the bed. It was set for... <laughs> I'm not sure. It had been set for that all week. Uh, I don't know whether it went off. Uh, but when I woke up, the alarm said 20 past 7. I saw blood all over the room and knew that... Uh, uh, I saw blood all over the room and knew that what I thought was a dummy was a man. I went to the door, saw the body lying on the landing, lifted his head, and saw it was a real man. At that moment, M Mrs. Duffy, as he calls her, it's actually Mrs. Duffy, uh, the old lady next door came to the door, and I told her that she'd better fetch the police. I left my door open and waited for the police to come. Right up until that time, I saw the man on the landing. Uh, I thought it was a dummy. So... So, poor Thomas, poor Thomas, and poor William. A bit of an odd one, isn't it? Let's just, uh, as mentioned, Marguerite Veach, uh, who lived next door. Uh, she'd gone to bed about 9.30 p.m., and she said it was definitely about 11.55 p.m. Uh, that she heard the three thuds, because she looked at a clock, but she didn't know where the, cl the thuds had come from. They could have been from the street outside or any of the flats. Uh, she said she stayed awake for about 10 more minutes before she fell asleep, but she didn't hear any other sounds. Uh, Mrs. Duffy, who was on the other side, on the right, I believe, um, was in bed by 10.45 p.m. Uh, she said she heard two thuds, but she didn't hear any voices. So there was definitely no screaming, no shouting, no violence, nothing, nothing weird that seems to be going on. Uh, what else is here? I think that's it. I think that's it. Let's just let me just scroll down. Uh, obviously, none of them had got f a telephone, so Mrs. Duthy had to shuffle down to the newspaper shop on uh, Rupal Street, and they called the police. Uh, the police turned up not too long afterwards. First officer on scene uh, saw the body lying down, wearing everything except for his jacket, collar, and tie. Uh, so obviously he'd, he'd kind of half prepped himself to, to kind of nod off um, feet were towards the door blood all across the landing uh, to the flat's doorway there was no light on uh, the, the landing had or the corridor had no uh, landing out no lights and it was still it wasn't quite dawn yet because obviously this is winter um, uh, William kept saying uh, is it real is that a real man if it is a real man I've done it uh, he came home with me last night. I thought he was joking with me. He was lying on the bed, making gurgling noises. I must have struck him with my bayonet and dragged him outside onto the landing. Uh, autopsy, as mentioned. So body declared extinct, 8.30pm. Removed to Southwark Mortuary. Uh, and it was Dr Keith Simpson who performed it, who we've heard from many times before. Time of death, roughly midnight. Cause of death, shock and hemorrhage caused by stab wounds to the face and neck. Uh, 17 stab wounds in total, 16 to the left-hand side of the head and the neck, uh, roughly in and around the cheek and the face and behind the, the ear, six pass deep into the neck, with two reaching a depth of four and a half inches, dividing the jugular vein and the exterior cartoid artery. There was extensive hemorrhaging, uh, if you look at the crime scenes, you'll see it's like um, where he fell on the floor. Um, there's a lot of blood there, like a lot of blood. It's just, So, yeah, he's really bleeding badly to death. Um, uh, what else is there? There was no, uh, d no defensive wounds at all. Um, <clears throat> the body had clearly been slid across the floor, so that, that all made sense. Uh... 
yeah, no, no, no wounds to kind of hands, arms, fingers, as you'd expect. So he's being stabbed in the in the head, but not moving at all. So who knows? Maybe, maybe Thomas had a heart attack during the night, or maybe he was just really, really, really unconscious to the point of maybe he was in in some kind of kind of alcoholic coma because he did not wake up at all. Um, what else is there? So uh, William was arrested. Uh, that day at 9.30 p.m. Uh, what else is there? I think that's it. He kind of gave a, a written statement. Uh, they they examined his clothes, as mentioned, his genitals and his anus. No seminal fluid was found on his clothing. Uh, a police found no evidence of indecency. Well, there we go. Uh, police conclusion that uh, he was in a drunken stupor, which may have caused hallucinations, and which is the reason he committed the crime. They believed it was a genuine mistake. There was no evidence of robbery, no evidence of revenge, because they didn't know each other. Um, he was committed to trial on the 12th of December 1950 uh, at Tower Bridge Magistrates Court <clears throat> on the charge of murder. The trial was held at the Old Bailey uh, in the new year, 9th of January 1951, charged of willfully and feloniously and with malice of forethought to kill and murder Thomas Meany. He pleaded not guilty to murder and reserved his right to call no defence, which he did. Um, he uh, pleaded guilty to manslaughter, the lesser charge, and as mentioned, he served uh, three years in prison. Um, where was... Oh, I've got to use my mouse again. Oh, this confusion of having two uh, two laptops. Thank God I haven't got three. Um, there was another bit in there where they, I think the press had gone to uh, London Transport where he was a bus conductor and said, uh, what's your thoughts on this? And they were like, oh, this is a really grave situation. Um and it was there that they said, even when he comes out of prison, we're not going to give him his job back. And it was just like, oh, you bastards! But it's not. It's not like he's a. Not like he's a nasty man. So uh, this didn't get much coverage. It didn't go international. This mostly uh, a local case, but uh, an interesting one, I thought. So I hope you like it. A little bit outside my usual remit, but I found the case and looked at it and thought, oh my god, this is this is too fascinating not to not to um uh bring this forward so uh there you go oh i haven't had a slurp of coffee ah yes right let's do some quiz questions question number one which benefactor created the peabody buildings the peabody buildings are also also the same buildings from uh the joseph king episode good night daddy um uh the answer to that question is George Peabody. The answer was in the question. Uh, question number two. What number bus was William the conductor on? It was number 10. Question number three. Where did the bus go from and to? It went from Brixton to Waterloo and back. It wouldn't make sense if you just had a bus that just went one way. Uh, question number four. William was playing darts with the employees of what company? amalgamated press question number five what job did thomas do and where he was a police driver at lambeth police garage question number six what brand was the gin that they consumed it was called booths question number seven william purchased a bottle of gin and a bottle of what it was orange squash. Question number eight. On what street did they say goodbye to Richard Copley? That was on Duchy Street, which is literally just around the corner from uh, Rupel Street. Uh, question nine. What time was William's alarm clock set to go off? It was 4.30 a.m. And question number ten. Who oversaw the investigation? It was Chief Inspector Leslie Knight. There we go. So that's that done. Oh, hope you enjoyed that. I'm gonna try, okay, how much power have I got on this laptop now? Oh, let's see. How much have you got? You're down to 57%. <sighs> Christ, I'm definitely going to have to go to the, the the old Costa and abuse their, their lecky. Anywho, hope you enjoyed that episode. 
that was uh, the, the uh, a dummy, a body, a dead man. Uh, two more episodes in this part of the season, uh, which I've already written, which is good, and hopefully I can edit them next week. And then there'll be, I think it'll be like a two two weeks, and I'm putting out a special episode that I've kind of part recorded. It's it was meant to be a new blue thing, but it's not really new blue. But it'll make sense when you get it. It's it's it's, it's interesting. It's just I I need to edit it. Uh, I need to really work out what i need it to be but it's going to be good and then we'll come back with the the rest of the season so i hope you enjoy that anyway that was the episode oh very hungover right have yourself a good week thank you for listening to murder and uh stay safe lots of love everyone <laughs>